Good morning. Can I remind members of the COVID-related measures that are in place and that face coverings should be worn when moving around the Chamber and across the Holyrood campus? The first item of business is general questions. In order to get in as many people as possible, I'd be grateful for short and succinct questions and responses to match. And at question number one, I call Paul Sweeney. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to reported warnings from residents, business and advocacy groups that the current quality of ferry service represents a real threat to island life. Minister Jenny Gilruth. The Scottish Government takes the views of these groups seriously. The aim is to make communities across Scotland, including island and remote mainland communities, attractive places to live, work, bring up families and to move to, so that Scotland's population profile provides a platform for sustainable and inclusive economic growth and wellbeing. The importance of transport links, including ferry services, is fully recognised as a key factor for island communities to assist in the ability of individual residents to, for example, access services and enjoy fundamental human rights. As part of our commitment to our island and remote communities, the Scottish Government has announced investment of £580 million in ports and vessels to support and improve Scotland's ferry services over the next five years as part of our wider infrastructure investment plan. Paul Sweeney. I thank the Minister for that answer. Can the Minister at least accept that the failure of the shipbuilding programme for Caledonia McBrain has been a key part in actually harming the quality of life for islanders and, and marginalised communities in Scotland? And can she commit to a national shipbuilding strategy and a continuous shipbuilding programme centred around the public sector procurement contracts for CMAL in order to build a proper sustainable shipbuilding industry in Scotland that will help lifeline communities in the islands? Minister. I thank Mr Spinney for his supplementary question. Um, I mentioned the investment of £580 million in ports and vessels over the next five years, and we are working constructively with key partners on this. I'm meeting this afternoon actually with CalMAC. I'm also meeting with Islands MSPs, and I'm meeting with the chair of the community board um, at CalMAC too. We did invest in a resilience fund in 2018-19 to look at ferry services to ensure that there was future reliability and availability of vessels, which I recognise as a challenge with an ageing fleet. Um, he asked me today to commit to a national shipbuilding plan. I'm not going to do that in the Chamber, but I am meeting with Mr Spinney later on on a, a separate issue uh, related to my portfolio responsibilities. I'll be more than happy to discuss that in, in further detail with him at that meeting. Jenny Minto. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As someone who lives on Isla, I have experienced the vagaries of the ferry service, but the quality of island life, in my opinion, is overwhelmingly positive. Yet again, we see Labour casting living on the islands in a negative light, while the Scottish Government is actively taking steps to tackle depopulation throughout the islands. Does the Minister therefore share my view that this latest example of Labour rhetoric, which may potentially discourage people who are considering moving to the islands, is both entirely partisan and extremely unhelpful in the image it portrays? Yes, right. Briefly, Minister. I think we need to make... Uh, our islands attractive places to live in, as, as Ms Minto has alluded to, and of course she lives in Islay, so she recognises some of the challenges here more so than I will. But there have been extended periods of um, extreme weather recently, which I know has directly impacted on the viability of a number of services. I'll be speaking to, as I mentioned to Mr Sweeney, Calmac regarding uh, these issues later today, and of course to Ms Minto and uh, a number of other colleagues who represent island communities. It's absolutely essential we get these services um, right for the people who live in our island communities. Question number two, Maggie Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the rollout of the home insulation programmes in the North East. Minister Patrick Harvey. In the financial year 2022-23, we'll invest £336 million in our heat energy efficiency and fuel poverty programmes. Since 2013, we've allocated £61 million through our area-based schemes to tackle fuel poverty in North East Scotland. These projects have benefited more than 18,000 fuel poor households. Vulnerable families in the North East will also benefit from the home insulation delivered through our Warmer Homes Scotland service. And we continue to provide free and impartial advice through our Home Energy Scotland service, uh, which includes advice about relevant grant and loan schemes to help meet the costs of improved home insulation. Maggie Chapman. Can I thank the Minister for his response and the information he's provided? Given the cost of living crisis we face and the significant role of rising energy bills in that, can he outline how the Scottish Government can maximise insulation and other measures to keep bills as low as possible? And what more can and should we all be doing in the longer term to tackle issues in the retrofit supply chain? Minister. Uh, thank you. These issues, have, of course, are, are gone into in great depth in the heat and buildings uh, strategy, which was 
published recently uh, and it, which does uh, have to be seen in the new context of the cost of living crisis. Uh, the Scottish Government is doing what it can to support people through the current cost of living crisis in the broader sense, including through our winter support fund uh, and other aspects of our uh, social security spending, which go beyond the resources allocated by the UK Government. Uh, however, in terms of, of the, the longer term development of a supply chain, we believe there are uh, some 16,400 jo jobs that can be created uh, in the uh, zero emission heating agenda, uh, good quality jobs uh, for, uh, uh, for Scotland, and, and that will, uh, of course, uh, go hand in hand with the regulatory approach that we're putting out uh, to make sure that all uh, housing in all tenures uh, achieves a good standard of energy performance as well as conversion to zero emission heating. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In December, I asked what was the best and most cost-effective way to insulate traditional granite homes, such as are found in the North East in Aberdeen. The Minister responded that Aberdeen homeowners could install solid wall insulation and suggested loans of up to £10,000 were available. Now, I assume the Minister researched the answer before giving it, so can he give me an indicative ballpark price of installing solid wall insulation to a traditional granite home in Aberdeen? And given the extreme disruption in building work required, how long, roughly, does it take? Minister. Uh, I'm afraid I don't have that precise data with me at the moment, but I'll write to the member and uh, see if we can answer the question in detail. Question number three, Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it can take to encourage dentists to continue treating NHS patients. Minister Marie Todd. Uh, we're doing everything we can to support NHS dentistry and we'll put patients at the centre of a sustainable public service. We're rapidly moving forward with NHS dental recovery and aim to return to more normal levels of activity as soon as infection prevention and control restrictions allow. Colin Smith. Thank, thank you, Minister, for that answer. It wasn't clear what support uh, the government are providing. Does the Minister um, understand why a third of dentists surveyed by the BDA are still considering leaving the profession, uh, despite what the government says. Every day, I have constituents being told, for example, that they have to wait months for NHS treatment and get the same treatment in days if they go privately. Does the Minister accept that in the short term, reducing COVID support will exasperate the problem, but in the long term, it is clear that the model is broken and we need a comprehensive review of dental services with far greater integration with our NHS. Minister. Um, in the short term, I think we need to focus on recovery. So we need to get more patients seen by more dentists. In the longer term, I don't disagree. I think there is a need for reform. I would dispute that there has not been good support. I will reiterate, as I did in the chamber yesterday, we're looking at a 9% increase in the budget for NHS dental services this year. There's been an um, additional sum of £20 million just this month of increased fees to uh, provide um, enhanced um, examinations. We've provided £50 million of support for dentists and £35 million for PPE. We've provided £5 million for ventilation improvements. We've provided £7.5 million for the purchase of new drills. And we have also assured the profession that we are not looking at a cliff edge at the end of this year in terms of withdrawing support. What we are looking at is a soft landing where we rejoin the link between reward, financial reward, and seeing patients. We need dentists to see more NHS patients. Lee MacArthur. To, key to returning NHS dental services uh, is the recruitment and retention of dental nurses. Uh, in Orkney, this is proving exceptionally difficult under the current funding model, with staff even being poached by the public dental service due to the disparity in paying conditions. So will the Minister agree to look at this issue specifically, and even whether uh, dental nurses providing NHS dental services can all be brought under the same pension provision? Minister. I'm certainly willing to look at that. The last thing we want to do is for displacement to occur for a problem that is happening in one part of the dental um, a provision to be just shifted to another part. We need the whole of the dental services to recover, and I'm more than happy if the member will be um, willing to write to me with the specifics of that inquiry. I'm more than happy to look into it and willing to try and sort it. Question number four, Graeme Simpson. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how it plans to ensure that islanders are not left without food supplies due to the reported lack of resilience of the ferry fleet. 
Minister Jenny Gilruth. The Scottish Government works with Calmac Ferries Limited to ensure that islanders are not left without food supplies and essential welfare provision is maintained. During periods of disruption, Calmac Ferries Limited will assess all the options available to maximise available capacity across the network. Calmac will prioritise traffic to ensure food and other lifeline supplies and services are available on the islands. Graham Simpson. Can I thank the Minister for that answer. EY's Project Neptune report into the flawed tripartite structure for procuring and running ferries has been with Transport Scotland for five months now. So will the Minister commit to publishing it now and giving a statement to Parliament? Minister. I would be more than happy to give that assurance to Mr Simpson and to, to give a parliamentary statement on it. Emma Roddick. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Our island communities have always had to contend with bad weather, but fortunately they have not also had to contend with a Tory government. Instead, they have had the benefit of an SNP government, which has invested over £2.2 billion in the Clyde and Hebrides and Northern Isles ferry services, bringing new routes, new vessels, upgraded harbour infrastructure and the rollout of significantly reduced fares through the RET scheme. Does the Minister agree that it is disingenuous and likely to cause undue alarm for Mr Simpson to suggest that the food security of Scotland's island communities is in jeopardy. Minister. In the event of disruption to supplies having an impact on health or well-being of our island residents, we will work with local resilience partnerships and our established multi-agency response teams to develop solutions. But our ferry operators during very difficult circumstances take every opportunity to exploit those weather windows where they have arisen, with the option, of course, of running amended or additional ceilings if needed to prioritise supplies and prevent that situation from arising. The, the period of weather disruption that I mentioned previously, combined with some issues with vessel resilience, brings into sharp focus the really essential nature of the lifeline connectivity that our ferry services provide to our island communities. And that is why Scottish ministers have committed to invest £580 million pounds in our ferry infrastructure over the course of the next five years. Question number five, Karen Adam. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what support is there to ensure more fish caught by Scottish vessels is landed and processed at Scottish ports? Minister Mary Gujol. The Scottish Government is due to introduce amended economic link provisions in January 2023 to help ensure that greater landings of quota stocks are landed into Scottish ports. We will also be producing a new seafood trade strategy which will set out our vision to ensure that Scotland has a thriving, sustainable and diverse Scottish seafood industry that is revitalising coastal communities. Through the Marine Fund Scotland, £6 million has supported Scottish processing facilities to upgrade their premises and improve automation to help enhance opportunity for Scottish landed catches to have value added in Scotland. Karen Adam. I uh, thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The Scottish Government has a strong track record of supporting the fishing industry in Banffshire and Bucking Coast. Most recently, the additional £1.8 million of funding for ports and harbours announced last year, which benefited Fraserburgh, Peterhead and Macduff. But Scotland is entitled to receive at least £62 million annually in replacement of the European Maritime and Fisheries Fund. And I therefore ask the Cabinet Secretary what impact has Brexit had on the funding for the vital projects and infrastructure which support fishing communities like those in my constituency? Cabinet Secretary. The impact of Brexit has been significant, and that's not only because of the losses and dislocation of markets, but also the reduction in quota that's been available for Scottish vessels too. Um, the member is absolutely right in, in what she said, because following EU exit, we also provided clear evidence to the UK government for a multi-year £62 million per annum allocation for marine funding, which is something that we could have accessed as EU members. But instead, the UK government has allocated only £14 million a year to Scotland, which just fails to recognise the value and importance of Scotland's seas. And additionally, it appears that the yearly £5.5 million top-up, which was previously provided to Scotland on the basis that the EU maritime and fisheries fund allocation was insufficient, isn't going to continue. So that actually means that in real terms, the funding available to support the seafood sectors and enhance the marine environment, improving biodiversity, has actually received a 28% cut compared to the previous three years. And ultimately, a reduced funding pot means that there's reduced opportunity to realise the benefits for coastal communities, for marine businesses and the marine environment in Scotland. But we will continue to use the limited funding that we do have to deliver maximum effect through the Marine Fund Scotland. 
Question number six, Brian Whittle. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to uh, reduce the adverse effects of food waste on climate change. Minister Lorna Slater. Scottish Government's 2019 Food Waste Reduction Action Plan set a target of 33% reduction in food waste by 2025. Delivery of this plan is ongoing and supported by Zero Waste Scotland. I am taking action and yesterday I launched phase two of our food waste marketing campaign, highlighting links between food waste and climate change, encouraging people to buy what they need, eat what they buy and recycle food waste that they cannot prevent. A review of the plan will be published this year and will identify additional areas of action required to meet that 2025 target. Brian Whittle. Uh, I thank the Minister for that answer. She will be aware that if food waste was a country, it would be the third largest greenhouse gas emitter behind the China and the USA. And in fact, food waste contributes four times the amount of greenhouse gas as does the global aviation industry. I wonder if the Minister agrees with me that not enough emphasis has been put on tackling food waste and we must stop vilifying our food producers. Minister. I thank the member for the question. I think uh, he's absolutely right that we mustn't vilify our food producers, that everybody can work together to tackle food waste and that it is an important contributor to climate emissions. Question number seven, Michelle Thompson. To ask the Scottish Government what steps are being taken to ensure access to care and support planning by a specialist team for people with ME and chronic fatigue syndrome, as recommended by NICE. Minister Marie Todd. The Scottish Government welcomes the National Institute for Health and Care Excellent Guideline on ME and Chronic Fatigue Syndrome published last October. We have commissioned an independent organisation to engage with the third sector, people with lived experience and clinical stakeholders to discuss how we move forward in implementing the NICE guideline recommendations in Scotland and, on a broader front, identifying and practically addressing priorities for service improvement in care for people with MECFS. I am looking forward to meeting with ME Action Scotland representatives just next week on the 3rd of March and directly hearing their views on improving the access to care and support for people affected by ME and chronic fatigue syndrome. Michelle Thompson. I thank the Minister for that res response. The emergence of SARS-CoV-2 and all of its variants has caused significant damage to people and families across Scotland. We know that ME-CFS can be triggered by infection in patients, although susceptibility may have a genetic element to it. Does the Minister therefore agree that access to care and specialist support is essential for those currently diagnosed and can she advise what work is being undertaken to identify any lasting effects from COVID infections that may lead to the development of any CFS? Minister. We are committed to ensuring that everyone living with ME-CFS in Scotland is able to access the best possible care and support and to benefit from healthcare services that are safe and effective and put people right at the centre of their care. Our approach in responding to long COVID is to support NHS boards to develop models of care which will be of benefit to the management of other long-term and complex conditions. Our Chief Scientist Office is supporting nine major research projects through the £2.5 million funding that are expected to contribute significantly to the clinical knowledge and the long-term effects of COVID-19, including to understanding more fully the nature of long COVID and the possible treatments for it. Question number eight, Emma Roddick. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on how the Distress Brief Intervention Programme is supporting people experiencing mental health crises. Minister Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, the award winning Distress Brief Intervention is a flagship programme which provides personalised, compassionate support to people who present to frontline services in emotional distress and who do not require emergency clinical services. DBI provides practical support which helps people to understand and manage their distress. As, as such, it forms a core element of the government's work to improving responses for people experiencing mental health crisis. Emma Roddick. I thank the Minister for that answer. The Distress Brief Intervention Programme was introduced in part to create a coherent approach in addressing mental health crises. With that in mind, can you tell me what is being done to ensure that access to mental health services is consistent across Scotland, in particular for those living in rural or island communities? 
Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and I thank Ms Roddick for that question, a very important one. Uh, DBI is available nationally uh, through NHS 24, uh, specifically in uh, the Highlands and Islands region. Inverness is one of the pilot areas for DBI. DBI is also now available in Murray and Orkney and is expected to go live in Argyll and Butte and the Western Isles in spring. Uh, more generally, uh, mental wellbeing support can be accessed through an individual's GP, NHS 24 and breathing space. And for anyone who feels they may cause immediate harm to themselves, they can reach out through 999.